This is a continuation of our discussion of creation and pre avicennian philosophy. What I scheduled for our readings in this, uh, in this part of the uh, presentation uh, were materials from the Liber de Causis, Alkindi's On the True Agent, and from the Perfect State by Al-Farabi, his discussion of the first existent. Most of the discussion here will be on the Liber de Causis. Only brief mention will be made of Alkindi's treatise on the true agent and also Al-Farabi. I leave those for you to examine yourself after the few remarks that I make here. The sources of the Liber de Causis are the elements of theology by Proclus, a metaphysical work by one of the greatest Neoplatonists. We find in the Liber de Causis selections from Proclus, not the entire elements of theology. In addition to that, we find in the Liber de Causis materials from the Plotiniana Arabica, that is, materials that we've already discussed from the Theology of Aristotle, the Letter on Divine Knowledge, and the sayings of the Greek wise men. We begin then with selections from the Kalam fi Macht al Kher, or Liber de Causis. The beginning of the Ankara and Istanbul manuscripts, we find the following In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, the blessings of God on Muhammad and his family, Discourse on the Pure Good. It is said that Proclus excerpted it from the Discourse of Plato, and it is also said that it is by Plato. In the other extant manuscript, the Leiden manuscript, we find the following. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, my success is only through God, the book of Aristotle's exposition on the pure good. Notice this is quite a difference. In the version that we have in the Leiden manuscript, it is Aristotle who is the author of this work, not Proclus or Plato in any fashion. In fact, the Latin tradition as well thought that Aristotle was the author of this, so it's possible that the Leiden manuscript is fairly closely related to what we find in the Latin. The first chapter of the Liber de Causis is uh, setting forth the teaching uh, which is foundational to the entire work, precisely as Aquinas says at the beginning of his commentary on the Liber de Causis. That teaching is the doctrine of primary causality. But it's worthy of noting here that what we have in the first chapter of the Liber de Causis is a statement of the principle of primary causality. It is not a proof but rather an explication of the doctrine of primary causality. Where do we find the proof for such a thing as primary causality? In the Liber de Causis, it's found in the last chapter, Arabic chapter 31 or Latin 31 or 32, where it's set forth as a proof that there is a true one which is the cause of unity for all other things. That chapter is translated from Arabic into English in the handouts we provided online for students in this class. It accompanies the other selection of readings from the Liber de Causis, so I leave it to you to look at for yourselves. I begin here with the first chapter of the Liber de Causis, and I want to go over this in some detail with you, so I'll read exactly what the text says. Quote, Every primary cause emanates more abundantly on its effect than does the universal second cause. When the universal second cause removes its power from the thing, the universal first cause does not remove his power from it. For the universal first cause acts on the effect of the second cause before the universal second cause, which is immediately adjacent to it, uh, to, to it, the effect acts on the effect. So when the second cause, which is immediately adjacent to the effect, acts, its act is not able to do without the first cause, which is above it. That is to say, the first cause is the cause of everything that is in any secondary cause after it. And everything that any secondary cause does is dependent upon what it received from the primary cause. We continue then. Quote, and when the second cause separates itself from the effect, which is immediately adjacent to it, the first cause, which is above the second cause, does not separate itself from the effect because it is the cause of the effect's cause. The first cause, therefore, is more the cause of the thing than its proximate cause, which is immediately adjacent to the thing. In this sense, then, the first cause remains in anything and passes all the way down through to the bottom of all causality, even if secondary causes could perhaps be removed. 
The author then goes on to explain this notion by means of forms or formalities. The author then goes on to explain this notion by means of forms or formalities, using the notions of being, living, and man. For a full translation of chapter one, see the course readings. Being is the foundation for living, for everything living must be a being, although not every being is living. Of course, a stone is not living. And man or the notion of man, distinctively involves rationality and is founded on living and being. Without living and being, rationality in man would not exist. After his example, the author continues, quote, So it has, come, has become clear and evident that the remote first cause is more encompassing and more a cause of the thing than its proximate cause. On account of that, its act has come to be more strongly adherent to the thing than the act of the thing's proximate cause. This came to be so only because the thing is first acted upon by the remote power, and then secondly it is acted on by the power which is below the first. The author then continues, quote, Moreover, the first cause aids the second cause in its act because every act which the second cause effects or brings about the first cause also effects, except that the first cause effects it in another transcendent and more sublime way. And when the second cause separates itself from its effect, the first cause does not separate itself from it, because the act of the first cause is mightier and more strongly adherent to the thing than the act of its proximate cause. Continuing, quote, Thus it has become clear and evident that the remote first cause is more a cause of the thing than its proximate cause, which is immediately adjacent to the thing, and that it, the first cause, emanates its power on the thing and conserves it and does not separate itself from it with the separation of its proximate cause, but rather it remains in it and strongly adheres to it in accordance with what we have made clear and evident. The opening proposition of the Liber de Causis consists in a restatement of the accounts of primary and secondary causality found in propositions 56, 57, and 70 of the Elements of Theology by the Platonist Proclus. Applied to caused entities of the world, this doctrine asserts simply that in the reality of any caused thing, in a hierarchy of per se causes, the first cause is present and more causally efficacious with regard to any effect than is any intermediate cause. This is the notion of primary causality. That doctrine is also applied here with regard to the intrinsic constituents of any cause items as well, since rationality is only possible in what is living, and living is only possible in what exists. The very existence that is causally traced solely to the primary cause is a necessary prerequisite in the constitution of living existence and rational existence. The account in the Liber de Causis chapter 1, then, is purely one of primary and secondary causality, with its focus on the explanation of the presence in every effect of the causality of the primary cause in any causal hierarchy that begins with a single productive primary cause. The doctrine of primary causality expressed here is one to which many philosophers ascribe in general import. Among them, Plotinus, Proclus, the author of the Liber de Causis, Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Avicenna, and many other philosophical and theological thinkers of the Greek, Arabic, and Latin traditions. In this doctrine, nothing in reality escapes the causal presence of the first cause in this teaching on primary and secondary causality. In chapter four, <clears throat> pardon me, in chapter four, like the Plotiniana Arabica, the author of the Liber de Causis states that intellect is the first created being. Quote, the first of originated things is being, and there is nothing originated prior to it, for being is above sense, above soul, and above intelligence. And after the first cause, there is nothing more extensive or having more effects than it. Continuing the quotation, so for this reason is it has come to be 
the most transcendent and most unitary of all originated things, that is, intellect. It has come to be so only owing to its proximity to the pure being and the true one, in which there is no multiplicity in any way whatsoever, namely the first cause. We've already seen the first called pure being and true one in the Platiniana Arabica, of course, in the earlier session. Chapter 8 of the Liber de Causis is not dependent on Proclus, but rather on Plotinus, as we've seen the, his thought in the Plotiniana Arabica. It begins, quote, the stability and the subsistence of every intelligence are only through the pure good, which is the first cause. This first cause is the originator of all things, the creator of all things. Quote, the intelligence then encompasses all things. The intelligence came to be so only due to the first cause, which, exalt, which is exalted over all things because it is the cause of intelligence, soul, nature, and all other, th all other things. And the first cause is not an intelligence, nor a soul, nor a nature, but rather it is above intelligence, soul, and nature, because it is the originator of all things. We continue then, quote, However, it is originator of the intelligence without mediation, and the originator of soul and nature and all of the things through the mediation of the intelligence. Divine knowledge is not like intellectual knowledge, nor like the knowledge of soul, but rather divine knowledge is above the knowledge of the intelligence and the knowledge of the soul, because divine knowledge is the originator of all types of knowledge. Divine power is above every intellectual, soul-based, or natural power, because divine power is the cause of every power. Close quote. The author then goes on to state an understanding of the first cause that proved to be extraordinarily important for Aquinas, who frequently quoted parts of the Latin translation of the following. Continuing, quote, The intelligence possesses form, hilia, because it is being and form, sura. Hilia and sura are synonyms here. And likewise, soul possesses form, and nature possesses form, but the first cause does not have form, because it is only being, ania facot. In the Latin, this comes through as esse tantum. So if someone says, it must have form, we say, its form is infinite, and its distinctive nature, shucks, is the pure good, pouring forth all excellences on the intelligence and on all other things through the mediation of the intelligence. In chapter 17, we see the following. The first again is alone the creator. Quote, the intelligence gives knowledge and the other things to what is below it, only in the manner of a form, not in the manner of origination, because the manner of origination, or creation, belongs to the first cause alone. The term fa'il, or agent, Occurs, in a num occurs a number of times and is used in chapter 19 to denote the first cause as a true agent, fa'ilun hokun, because it acts immediately in virtue of its own being, the aniyatihi, without there being any intermediary or addition between it and its effects. Proposition 122 of Proclus, on which chapter 19 is based, concerns governance, namely providence, on the part of divine beings, the gods. In chapter 19, the author introduces a notion of thoroughly pervasive governance to the utmost degree, implying that this penetrates through all things. That this governance takes place without instrument and immediately in virtue of the being of the first cause, not the plurality of gods, but the first cause, makes this agent a true agent. That is, by the very act of its being, it is a true agent and a true governor which effects, that is, makes, brings about, things with the utmost of thoroughness beyond which there can be no other thoroughness of greater degree, and which directs its act with the utmost of governance. Like primary causality, 
through its one and only act, which is not distinct from its being, the first cause's governing action penetrates to all things, while any governance or providential action involving an instrument is one in which the agent is distinct from its act and unable to exercise authentic governance. This notion of true agency on the part of the first cause also appears in the Plotinian Arabic at numerous times. For example, in the Theology of Aristotle, we find, quote, the intellect is the first act of the one true agent, close quote. And in the sayings of the Greek wise men from the Plotinian Arabic, the author writes that the first agent is also the cause of the entity, huia, of soul, through the mediation of intelligence. Furthermore, the first does not act through a form of its own. For in the Plotiniana Arabica and in chapter 8 of the Liber de Causis, the first is said to be without form, sura or hilia, and to be only being, ania fakot. Similar to what's found in the Liber de Causis 19, in the sayings of the Greek wise men, we find the following, quote, the first agent is a complete cause, for it is the cause of the entity, huia, and form, sura, of the thing without intermediary. Close quote. The reference to the thing here is a reference to intellect, the first created entity. In the sayings of the Greek wise men, we find the statement that the first is above will and volition. And the reason is that this would be another act in addition to its essence, thereby introducing plurality into the essence of the first, which is absolutely one, as we've already seen. The text in the sayings of the Greek wise men then go on to stress that the first agent does not wish, lam yaridu, the origination of intellect such that it comes about after an act of the will, al irada because there was no willing preceding its act. Rather, it would be a sign of deficiency for there to be will, alirada, between it and its product, since it does not go from one action to another, but instead, quote, originates all things at once, tafatan wahidatan. What we see then is that, the, that origination is the making out of nothing prior by the single immediate act of the first cause. This act comes about immediately upon its essence and is the very expression of its essence, not something additional to it. It does not come about by will, but immediately comes from the first. This is the Neoplatonic notion of a thing acting by its very being, ata ata enai, and not by an act added to its being. The author of the Liber de Causis adopted this notion from Proclus and in all likelihood also from the Plutiniana Arabica to argue that this sort of causality, the aniyatihi, or in virtue of its very being, belongs only to the first cause. This makes the first the only true agent, since all other things act only in virtue of the substance and power they owe to the first. In the Plotiniana Arabica, this notion is associated with the view that the first of the first as above will, choice, and decision, and not necessitated in its actions by any internal necessity based on its nature or form, or by any external necessity or compulsion. Insofar as it is the one and the good, its emanative causality of all other realities is not an act additional to its essence, but rather follows immediately upon the existence of the good, the one, the first cause. In the Liber de Causis, and also in the Plotinian and Arabica then, the notion of origination or creation does not entail divine will. But in the Abrahamic tradition, such a notion does seem to entail a divine will that was free not to create or originate the world, if God so choose. Perhaps then we should consider creation to be of two types, one 
philosophical sort that does not entail divine will, and another of a religious sort that does entail divine will that need not have created the world. Let's leave that as an idea to think about and to address later. In the readings I've provided you with a short treatise on the true agent by Alkindi. This is a treatise on primary causality couched in the language of agency. It asserts that the only true agent is the first cause, which acts without anything presupposed to it. All other agents are only metaphorical agents, not real or true agents, of which there is only one, the first cause, the one, the good. However, Alkindi taught a doctrine of temporal creation. How that fits with this treatise would be a good topic for a student course paper, since I cannot pursue it here. The notion of primary causality is also at work in the thought of Al-Farabi, an importantly influential thinker for the development of philosophy, the philosophy of Avicenna, whose metaphysical thought we will begin to explore in next class. For the present, let me just cite the opening lines of the course readings from Al-Farabi's Al perfect state and leave it to you to explore his philosophical thinking in the readings. He writes, quote, The first being, Maujud, is the first cause for the being of, for all the rest of the beings. The Latin Libre de Causas. Taken by Latins as a work by Aristotle completing his metaphysics of God and higher realities, such as intelligences or angels, movers of the heavens and the minions of God, this completes then Aristotle's metaphysics, for these things were not sufficiently discussed. It was required formal reading in the study of metaphysics at the, at the University of Paris. The text itself, Latin, was translated by Gerard of Cremona at Toledo. Today, its popularity is witnessed by the fact that there are over 250 Latin manuscripts extant. There are also over 20 commentaries by such figures as Aquinas, Albert the Great, Roger Bacon, the Averroist Sajur Brabant, and many others. Its broad and deep philosophical importance can be gauged by representative examples of its use by Thomas Aquinas. This is the first of three texts from on Being in Essence, or De Ante et Essentia, by Thomas Aquinas, one of, his first, earliest, one of his earliest works, a short work done at the same time as his commentary on the sentences. Quote, In a soul or intelligence, there is no composition of matter and form, understanding matter in them as it is in corporeal substances. But there is in them a composition of form and being, forma et esse. It's exactly the language of the Dickhouses. That is why the commentary on the Book of Causes says that an intelligence is that which has form and being, and by form here is understood the quiddity itself, or simple nature." Close quote. The second of three texts from Aquinas, all of them from the De Ante Essentia, or On Being in Essence, quote, If we say that God is pure being, esse purum, we need not fall into the mistake of those who held that God is that universal being by which everything formally exists. What he's referring to is pantheism. The being that is God is that such that no addition can be made to it. Because, if it's pure, because of its purity, therefore, it is being distinct from all other being. That is why the commentary on the Book of Causes says that the first cause, which is pure being, esse tantum, is individuated through its pure goodness. The third of the three texts of Aquinas, quote, Furthermore, although God is pure being, it is not necessary that he lack other perfections or excellences. On the contrary, he possesses all the perfections of every kind of thing, so that he is called absolutely perfect, as the philosopher and the commentators say. The philosopher here is referring to the philosopher in the philosopher's Book of Causes. I continue. In fact, he possesses those perfections in a more excellent way than other things, because in him 
they are one, whereas in other things they are diversified. Continuing the third text, quote, This is because those, all those perfections belong to him in virtue of his simple being. In the same way, if someone could produce the operations of all the qualities through one quality alone, in that one quality he would possess every quality. Similarly, God possesses all perfections in his being itself. For next class, here are the following readings. All of these are available on Toledo. First, the primary texts. Uh, so I'm requesting that you read these texts from the, in the translation from the Arabic by Michael Marmora, pages 194 to 213. I also give you the reference and provide for you the Latin text if you wish to read it in Latin. Secondly, we also request that you read the secondary source, Anton Pegas, in the title, St. Thomas and the Origin of the Idea of Creation. 